Uh, we're going to talk about the CMIO, CNIO roles within the UC system. As you know, UC Health, we have five com coming on six new hos hospitals. We started to actually develop a partnership over the past two years where now we started to actually form a team. We meet with them once a month. It's been very nice to actually share, share ideas and really decide how we can make it so that the EMR will suck less. All right, so with that, with that being said, I'm going to in, introduce our pa panel here. First up, we have Dr. Brian Clay, CMIO for UC UCSD. <laughs> Eric Chang, CMIO, UCLA. John, John Lau, MD from um, UC UCR. <laughs> Scott, McDon Don Scott McDonald, from uh, UC Davis. Uh, the next one up here is a battle axe nurse. Oh, sorry. Margaret O'Brien, who was a... I've known Margaret for umpteen years. She busted me as a resident for drinking coffee in a room one time, and since we've been friends for life. So, Mar Margaret, who we affectionately call Mob. Ellen Polak from UCLA, CNIO there. And fi finally, Susan Wynn from UCSD. All right, thank you for that. So our plan is to actually have me toss some softball pit pitches to, to this team here, have them hopefully hit, hit these. The goal is going to be to, again, give our view on healthcare, the EMRs, and then also how we can really use this tool. Because again, it comes down to, Dr. Ed, Ed Marks made the great point that this is about really patient care. Tech is just the tool. So with this being said, I'm gonna go down our list of questions here. First one we've got for the group. Now that electronic medical records are largely deployed in, ac in academic medical centers, what are the current top priorities of a CMIO or a CNIO? So we'll start with that, and Mar Margaret, of course, grabs the mic first. I'll get this over with. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's really the organization and the clinician's priorities are our priorities. Um, you know, now that we have an EMR in place, it, we're in the enhancement, enhancement mode and really needing to respond to the organizational needs. That's what our priorities are. Um, there are a lot of... Um, uh, teams going on, Lean Six Sigma teams, there's a lot of new regulatory requirements, and we're in the forefront of all of those things. Um, one, of, one of the examples is recently we have a throughput, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody's dealing with this, throughput, that's a big, big deal, um, trying to uh, manage throughput, and we've been struggling with that for, for several years on a lot of different fronts. Um, and I participate in a Lean Six Sigma team uh, on throughput, and one of the things that they identified was the bottleneck of getting the patients from the emergency department up to the units. Um, it was taking too long, and a large part of that centered on the handoff process and people having time to actually pick up the phone and talk to the other person to give them the handoff information. Um, and there was a clinician that um, took this over and came to us in IT uh, to help with an electronic solution. And by the way, most of the problems that the um, clinicians face in terms of errors um, or improvement needs, they turn to IT for a solution. Um, and we are the translators between the clinicians and the analysts that, that build. So as part of that work, um, we did develop a very robust and, um, handoff tool for nursing um, that took several months to, to hone in on. Um, we've got data for satisfaction before and after that um, was implemented and it's very positive. And now we're moving to look at data, how, how did we affect um, that process, did we speed up those that, that um, transfer to the floor to the unit? So that's just one example, um, I think, that, uh, of how our priorities um, really reflect the organization's priorities. All right, thanks for that. So throughput's key. Anything else to the pa panels? Scott, go next. 
Yeah, so speaking of priorities, I think a big role that I play and I think we all play is adjudicating the different priorities that are coming from different areas of the organization. You know, the uh, clinicians have a set of priorities. Basically, it's making the EMR suck less, right? Um, or, which is a, a big issue, is just that the EMR is actually pretty good if you know how to use it well. And a lot of our folks just never got enough training to know how to use it well. So training our physicians and helping them make the best use of the tools they already have, I think is very important. But at the same time, we have all kinds of mandates coming from the federal government, from state, local regulations, <laughs> healthcare, uh, uh, strategic goals, and trying to balance all those things against the real needs of the clinicians that they need to be able to take care of patients. And I think that's a real important role that we all serve. Brian? So uh, in addition to that, I'll add the area of security and cybersecurity. Uh, not that we as clinical informatics leadership are going to be configuring uh, uh, malware detection systems or implementing any of those things, but all of those things that we need to implement to keep our systems safe and our data protected influence the experience of the end user. Uh, how many uh, people out there that are currently on their phones, I can see you all, uh, have a PIN number to get into the phone? Nobody, or nobody wants to cop to using the phone. <laughs> So one of, the thing, one of the key things that uh, in this new world of using mobile devices for clinical management is how do we keep those mobile devices secure at a very basic level. One of the core things you should have is a PIN or a password on the device so that if you set it down, somebody else can't pick it up and see patient information on your phone. Part of the job of the clinical informatics leadership is to champion these things to be early adopters, to show why it matters and why it improves care, uh, and in a little bit of a role, be the salesperson out to the larger clinical uh, uh, population as to why these technologies are needed and how they actually help us deliver better and safer care to patients. Eric? Yeah, maybe I'll take a step back and say, um, what, what is the work that we do as CMIO and CNIOs? I really divide it into three buckets of work. So there's the um, work that comes from above us. So um, I'll speak for the CMIOs. We typically report to either a CIO or a CMO. And they will tell us kind of pretty broad, um, I guess, topic that needs to be worked on, such as you know, throughput or medication reconciliation. Nothing really specific, but they say these are areas of focus. And then there's a bucket of work that comes from below, comes from the physician community, and, and they'll say something like, on this screen, can you default this value so we don't have to click a button? So something very, very specific. And then we have to find out, is it a, you know, a problem for that user, or is there something more generalizable? And then there's the scope of work that we decide that you know, based on our knowledge of what the um, kind of clinical leadership wants, as well as the kind of frontline clinicians, think that this is a solution that can help them, even if nobody's really advocating for it because they didn't, haven't thought about it. Um, so when you say the top priorities, it's kind of a, a mix of all three. We have to understand what our kind of frontline clinicians want, as well as what our um, uh, clinical leadership wants as well. And sometimes we, as someone said, serve as a translator between those groups and the, and the IT team. Um, but I echo kind of what the, the specific items, you know, security, kind of efficiency of the EHR are kind of big hot topics, uh, I guess. Um. Good. Anyone else? John? Uh, I would say that in many ways, although I am a psychiatrist to the, for full disclosure, uh, as a, uh, you know, we are actually like therapists for the entire, for both the uh, administrators who want, why can't you get that doctor to do it this way? Or that, that, that uh, clinician's been really uh, problematic, you know, I, I remember, I won't name who, but like when they have uh, a clinician adopt, working on Epic, and for example, at, at UCLA when I was there, they would send me in because they were like, oh wait, I'm seeing the psychiatrist, oh, there must be a problem. But, but really what it is, is we are there to help, you know, both our compadres, you know, the clinicians understand why things 
get done and, and help them really deal with the loss so that they actually know something well, the prior EHR or the prior way things got done. And so it's really our job to really, in, as part of change management, to really not only provide the education or the clinical reasons why, but to help them through that process, whether it's through, you heard, additional trainings or uh, talk about or help them understand what some of these things coming down the pike are, why, what's the background for it, such as uh, uh, just as basic as macro, like someone told one of the neurologists at UC Riverside looked at me and said, macro, I, oh my God, I can't keep up with anything else. What is that, John, and why do I need to know? And so it is my job to help them uh, understand that information and how that impacts our system and impacts, you know, we change it, our changes in our workflows. So we, I think, you know, I think of us as therapists, but maybe that's just because I'm a psychiatrist. <laughs> Sue? I think one of the things that I've found is it's, it's not always about the technology. One of the things I learned when I um, first uh, came into this field was that you need to have the people in the process together before you implement any type of technology. I have a lot of people that walk up to me and say, you know, we need this, this, and this. And it's like, well, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about the people and the process about around this before we start throwing some piece of technology into it. It's not always the solution for everything that you need. We have put many things in the system because we, as an application team, think, wow, that's a really good idea. Or I brought something home from um, user group meeting, and we need this right away, and it, it fails miserably because we don't have the people in process around it. So I think one of the things that we do is we help people sort through that before we put something into our systems that we think is going to help our users. I think we need to echo that point. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, I was getting an MBA right after the dot bomb. The message that was told to me three times over was, Technology augments. A good process goes faster. A bad process also goes faster. So you need to focus on the process, the people first. Te technology is easy. Zeros and ones, flip the switch. So workflow is key. That's, I think, ma our main role as CMIOs, CNIOs is to translate that, that what is your real want and need here? Not a tech fix. All right, on that topic is a fo follow-up. Should CMIOs or CNIOs continue to practice clinically? The other way to say this is, should we still eat the, eat the dog food that, that we make? Yes. <laughs> I feel very strongly about this. I'm a practicing primary care internist, um, and I see two real values in continuing to practice. The first one is credibility. And just the fact that I'm eating the dog food that I'm making with the IT team gives me that credibility with my other clinical colleagues. Um, and they know that I'm looking out for them because I'm going to have to deal with all this stuff too. So really key on that point. The other thing is um, over the last year I've dropped my full-time equivalents down a bit. And I've even just, even though I'm still practicing, I don't practice as much and I'm feeling my skills with using the system slip a little bit. And so I don't want to cut back anymore because then I'm just not going to know how to use the system effectively. Um, and I think knowing how to use that is um, important for two reasons. One is being able to identify what the bad things are and how it sucks. And so I can bring the issues of the EMR that I know really need to be fixed because I know what the impact is on all my colleagues. Um, and uh, so I think that's the main thing I would argue for continuing to practice clinically. So Brian I'll uh, Rich, yeah. I'll add to Dr. McDonald's point. I, I also agree that a, a CMIO or a, a CNIO, if possible, should continue to practice clinically, especially on the physician side. Uh, I'm an internist by training and a hospital medicine physician by practice. Uh, and not only does continuing to practice keep my skills up as an end user with the electronic medical record, it also keeps my eyes on how operational workflows evolve over time. Believe it or not, sometimes they change how things work in the hospital and do not tell the IT team that this is the case. And not until we clinicians go out there into the land and see what is happening do we realize that we need to evolve the build in the electronic medical record or change some things around to support those new workflows and make them better? Uh, there's a big argument actually going on in the CMIO community about the whole st uh, street cred issue on if you use the system, do you have street cred? Does it get you in with the docs? And people tend to hold uh, strong and equally unsupported opinions on this. Uh, but from my own personal perspective, uh, I do think it's valuable to be a doctor 
in the system, to touch it as an end user, to experience all that it brings and all that it still needs to bring. Mar Margaret? Uh, as a nurse, I really miss patient care. And um, that was really highlighted, I'm gonna deviate just for a minute, but that was really highlighted recently when um, I, I went on a medical mission into Cambodia uh, several months ago and was placed in a position of treating patients. And be, the nurses that were, were with me, many of them got sick, and I didn't. Um, so I ended up having to triage and uh, diagnose and refer and prescribe for patients. Um, that was quite a stretch. Um, but it, was a, it really did bring home how much I miss taking care of patients. And a, a funny note, I, I walked in that, that one day and I wasn't prepared to do this, and the head nurse said to me, um, you're gonna do um, triage today, and I said, well, all right, I, I need a pen. And she indignantly looked at me and said, what kind of nurse doesn't have a pen? <laughs> and I said, an informatics nurse. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. But the, the point is, I do miss patient care, but I, I, and I really applaud um, our physician colleagues that they're able to carve out time to be able to, to continue to practice. I don't see how uh, the nursing people can do that. Um, there are so many competencies that one has to keep up with now in, in care that I don't think that um, we'd really be able to be able to continue with that and do the role that we do. But one thing that we can do and we do do is we shadow nurses so that we do get a feel for what they're doing. Um, I've spent a whole day with the nurse and gone through a whole shift and we learn a lot by doing that. Um, get, we're getting into the detail of their work. All right. Uh, Ellen? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Margaret just said. I think um, in theory it sounds wonderful, but in reality it is hard from a nursing perspective to carve out 12-hour shifts and to keep your competency up in that specialty area and um, to really make that happen. But what is essential is to stay in the weeds. You have to be out in the units. You have to be talking to nurses. It's not just rounds. We've done rounds for many years. You uncover some things on rounds, but as Margaret said, shadowing, really being out there working side by side and watching workflows, you uncover all kinds of things. You had no idea what, uh, what was happening and people find really interesting workarounds and unless you're out there really digging into the details, you will, it's really hard to uncover those things. Eric? Um, so maybe I'll just have a little bit of a, uh, as Brian point, a, a counter opinion about this. So our chief medical officer doesn't practice and yet is the head of, you know, leads some, uh, a lot of medical initiatives in, in our health system. I think there is an emerging role that didn't exist five years ago of a physician informaticist or a nurse informaticist. So these are not, let's say, the leaders of kind of, you know, they, they don't lead teams, but they have been chosen by the organization to, uh, to uh, be some more of the front line because a lot of us spend a lot of our times in meetings um, with, uh, with, uh, with lots of people. Um, but the role of a physician informaticist very more, more commonly is to be someone who is, you know, a per certain percentage, and it's not the majority of their time uh, uh, in informatics, but the, but the majority of their time, therefore, is spent doing their clinical work. So essentially, we buy out uh, a small percentage of their time to work on IT, and yet leave the rest of their time so they can still continue to practice and then getting information from folks like those um, is, is really important because they can, um, they're probably even better suited to walk between two worlds and yet they don't have to be tied off with some of the administrative duties that, as required as someone in the C-suite. So. I think the beginning of my career in informatics in the mid 90s, I did walk in both worlds. I maintained a system in a, a niche system in a, in a 20 bed ICU. So one day a week I did do a 12 hour shift caring for patients and reaping the benefits or the detriments of the work that I was doing in that system, which worked quite well. It was difficult though on those clinical days, I would always get pulled aside, hey, this doesn't work, let's try to work on this or can you help me get my uh, computer going again? So it was, it was tough, but um, I think 
today the roles that we play with the larger EMRs. It, would, it is difficult, but I echo the sentiment of Ellen and Margaret that we do need to get out and walk in our user's shoes periodically. I know our team has uh, been stretched pretty thin these last few years, and it's always on our, our um, annual goals is to get out more with our users. We do interact a lot with our, in our user group meeting, but um, it, it, does, it does lend a lot of street, street cred to be able to get out there and, and see exactly what our users are doing day to day and discover all their awesome workarounds. Good. Awesome. All right. All right, so um, what do you see as the likely areas of technical innovation over the next three to five years? What strategic direction do you see for the CMIO, CNIO roles? And kind of following up on, doc, on, doc, on Dr. Cheng's point about that, it's starting to evolve. Back in the day, there was one CMIO. Now most of us have a team. I mean, I have 15 docs. Dr. Clay has the, uh, roughly the same, same, same amounts. It's starting to shift. We're getting more and more doctors and nurses involved, honestly, on the IT coin or the IT, IT, IT dole. So how is this going, going to shift? Did I stump the group? <laughs> Wimps. All right, I'll Brian, talk. thank you. Um, it's challenging. Um, because uh, in a lot of ways, we've got uh, kind of a, a foot in the past and a foot in the future. We see that we've largely deployed the electronic medical record. That's uh, much of the reason why the CMIO role came to be was to make sure that EHRs were deployed, often driven by meaningful use dollars at risk. Um, but now they're fully deployed, and we spoke to this earlier, is the need to go back and optimize the system and gain efficiencies. and train up end users and make them more proficient with the systems. So we're still trying to bring people along uh, to the adoption of the EHR. But at the same time, there are all those early adopters out there, doctors and otherwise, who know a guy or who have a spun-off company or who are interested in mobile apps who are coming to you and say, hey, here's this thing that solves my little niche solution. Can we integrate this with our core systems? Or uh, can we uh, uh, start... Uh, uh, doing this new technical thing in the clinic because we're going to do a new surgical procedure, et cetera. Um, and part of the, uh, the technical innovation uh, role of the CMIO is to learn how to identify those things that align with the organization's strategic goals uh, and the strategic initiatives that the enterprise has at a high level. Uh, it's often said for those of us that are big fans of governance and prioritization, that we can do anything, but we can't do everything. So uh, uh, part of the role in technical innovation is helping all of those out there who are already trying to innovate, to shepherd along those things that look like they're gonna have high value and that align with the organization's goals uh, and to prioritize appropriately. The other uh, aspect that, uh, or opportunity we have as CMIOs is that it's a fairly tight-knit community. And the physician informaticists, uh, either regionally or nationwide, everyone is doing a new innovative thing, but they're all kind of different. So there's a huge opportunity to learn from each other from a networking standpoint and to take those things that are being done out there, either elsewhere at another UC or elsewhere at another uh, organization in another state outside California and say, we should pursue this adoption and then make that argument to the organization, this will benefit us because. Uh, and I, th I see that as a, a key role of us uh, going forward. Good. John? Yeah, just to further along that line, I would say that our, our, it's not so much which areas of technology, technolo technical innovation, but, you know, we're really, I think, in the being able to speak both languages, if you will, in the best position to understand which ones, as Brian said, makes the most sense, and really educate our user, our end users, our, our our physicians and our nurses and other clinicians, why you know why that will make will actually have an impact or it really is a lower priority because you know customer service is really part of what we do in the sense that uh, we're there with you on the IT side to help explain oh yeah that cool new app or you know that new device you have well you you got to make sure you got this device management software on it because otherwise you know there'll be vulnerabilities things of that nature so I think. We like to be at, the, I personally like to be at the forefront of evaluating all these new tools and uh, uh, hot things, like if you will, because one, I enjoy the risk, but uh, uh, the other part of it is I think I see myself as helping really uh, advocate for what really makes the most sense.
Kirk. So areas of, of technical innovation. So I view um, uh, a lot of electronic health record as a way to organize a lot of data. And uh, what I see as a big problem, especially for frontline clinicians who are really overwhelmed with the amount of data they currently see, is how to be able to equip them for all the massive amounts of data they could see in the future that they don't see now. So if they, in a few, we will be able to identify a patient with you know, a few kind of uncommon genomic data that will raise some percent from like rare to uncommon. You know, how, what do you do with that data? If patients enter every, kind, you know, how many steps they take a day for the last year, you have all this data, how do you summarize that data? Because, you know, if you t take an intern in an ICU, they'll take the minimum and the maximum and then, you know, because that's their best way to summarize a lot of data. All this is going to come to us and we have to find some way to simplify it so it's actionable. Um, big data is going to bring in a lot of uh, information that we've just haven't uh, really brought to frontline clinicians. You'll know how you're an outlier on every medication or every treatment of every condition. You know, is that, you know, good or bad? And they already have a hard time, I think, incorporating uh, all the kind of data they have right now, and yet we're going to place more of a demand on them. So being able to, to, to technical innovation to create that, to, to analyze that data and present it in, a, in an actionable way to a provider, I think is going to be. Um, I think the easy, the fun part is trying to analyze the data, but then making it actionable to, um, to a clinician, I think is going to be tougher, and yet I think that's one of the things that we haven't really solved yet. Scott? Yeah, I'll riff off of that a little bit and I'll say, I can expand that a little bit just into the user experience overall. I think that's what I'm sensing a real hunger for amongst our EHR users is that we've got the system that work, works great to capture data for billing reasons, but it wasn't designed from the, the ground up to be able to show information in a way that helps clinicians make good clinical decisions. And I think that hasn't been done because it's such a complicated problem. Because so many patients have so many different things going on with them that we need new technologies. So that kind of begs the question for AI, right? And so, you know, I don't know if this is a likely area of technical innovation in the next five, three to five years, but I hope it will be at some point where the computer is smart enough to be able to anticipate my needs in terms of what information I need at a given point in my workflow and present that to me when I need it. Um, so I think you, uh, user experience design and artificial intelligence, I think, are two areas that have great potential to really make EHRs what live up to their promise. You know, kind of like all the consumer technology that we use in our daily lives, you know, it's great. We know how just a few taps and a swipe and we can access the information of the whole world in Wikipedia. But we haven't brought that innovation yet to EHRs and I think we need to. Else. All right, follow-up follow question on that is, how can the CMIO or CNO help drive, inno, in, 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 drive innovation? Uh, I think by staying one step ahead of um, even where the organization <coughs> knows that they want to go. So if you're in touch with where the organization wants to go and what opportunities are out there and what innovation exists, you can show a path that uh, clears the way for achieving goals that the organization might not even know that they really want. So I think part of it is usability, how to get information to the point of care. Uh, we're doing a lot with mobility now, and we have so many innovative people at UCLA and all our other campuses that are uh, creating apps for certain diagnoses and are pushing this information to the patient. And how do we get that information to the patient uh, in uh, have the patient interact with these apps, but also bring it back to the electronic medical record. So we're trying to stay ahead of the curve and build these pathways to make that simpler and easy to use and more innovative. Brian? So uh, just to extend on that, uh, one of the key ways that we can be innovative is to uh, look out there to other organizations and see how other people are innovating. Yes, we have a lot of creative people internally, uh, but if you expand your network, the uh, amount of creativity you can be exposed to is substantial. 
Uh, one of the things we've started doing at San Diego is inviting uh, clinical informaticians, you know, physicians who are CMIOs or sim similar roles at uh, other organizations throughout the country to come and give presentations on their work. Uh, this has spun off local efforts and gotten people really excited about more than a few things that they've then seen that we hadn't really ever thought about doing. And one example is we had a physician out from the Brigham uh, to talk about their digital innovation strategy and their annual hackathons that they would put together and they would invite people from their school of engineering and from their computer science department as well as uh, people from within the healthcare system to get together and rapidly code mobile apps or other things to help solve specific problems. And everybody that came to this talk got super fired up about it. So we were actually working with uh, the Children's Hospital in San Diego and the, the informatics team there as well as uh, with folks at Irvine. Uh, to put together a hackathon in March of 2017. This is our first foray into this, but we're really excited about it. And uh, the lesson I'm taking away from this is just exposing yourself to what other people are doing out there can lead to brand new things that maybe had never crossed your mind previously. All right. Next up we have, how do we ensure that we have a pipeline in place for future cl cl clinicians who want to have a role in clinical infor informatics? John. Well, I know they do this at UCLA already. There is a resident informaticists program where uh, resident physicians and all uh, primary care and specialties apply. Uh, frankly, at UC Riverside, our, uh, we only have three residencies, so it's a little tough. But, uh, you know, part of it, I think, is really, first of all, by being in the positions we're in and being visible, uh, both in the health system and at other meetings, for example, I ran across a Kaiser Fontana. Um, addiction specialist here who said, was just happy to find me at this meeting and so I think that having the opportunity to mentor and sort of you know show I think the future generation why what, not only what we do is important but really what we do is fun and have that passion as you heard the keynote speaker mention that's really important to really sort of make somebody who thought for example in psychiatry they were going to go into say you know addiction um, specialty or child psychiatry think well wait a minute, wait a minute maybe I should consider clinical informatics as a specialty too. And so I think it's really important to sort of for us to be out there and talking about this and being visible as well as networking, not just at HIMSS meetings, but that includes, you know, at the school of medicine level or school of nursing level to say, you know, this kind of career is actually innovative and fun and you really should uh, join the group. Eric? Yeah, so I do a lot of interviews for selecting the resident informaticists over at UCLA as well as the clinical informatics fellowships. So clinical informatics fellowships are those who've graduated from residency and want to do a two-year additional kind of in-depth training. Now, granted, it's a biased sample, but the people I talk to are all very, you know, they grew up in a digital age. They use technology in all aspects of their lives, and they're very, very interested in trying to help implement, you know, technologies in, um, in their work as clinicians. Um, so I think there's going to be, certainly there's, I guess, a subset of clinicians who are very interested in dedicating a large portion of their kind of career toward this field. Though the one thing that I'm a little concerned about, um, a little bit of a side, you know, medical schools are ranked by how, you know, the proportion of their graduates who make it to residency, and that's kind of a ranking that, um, that you can compare against each year. And so there are schools like UCF is, UCSF isn't here, but I could rip on them a little yeah. bit. Um, so UCSF and Stanford used to be like the very top schools in this, that like that very, like almost all of their graduating class would go on to a residency from medical school. And now they're at the bottom. And why are they at the, at the bottom? Is because 25% of their class gets siphoned off by the high tech firms in, you know, the Bay Area to go directly from, you know, medical school toward those areas. So I'm a little concerned that some of the you know, future clinicians actually don't go to, you know, residency and practice. So I back to kind of an original point, whether you practice now or not, um, that's being debated, but I think everyone, I think, would, would all agree, you should have practiced at least some point, because if you go straight to, from medical school to, I guess, some of these high-tech firms, you, you sort of know what, you know, being a clinician is like, but really, not really, I, I would say. So, um, I, I hope that you know people who are interested in the medical field and 
you know, have the informatics kicks still go on to be, you know, a board certified clinician so they know a little bit more of the front lines so that they can apply both worlds and not go straight to, um, to high tech straight from medical school. Good. Sue? Um, uh, the people on, I have, most of the people on my team are clinicians. I have a, uh, one person that is not who actually is one of the managers on my team, but I get frequently asked this, how do I break into this field? And I think it's just having a passion for it. Some, some of the best people on my team are people that just were, they were super users. They were out, they came to our, um, our informatics meetings and they just had a passion for this. Yeah, they have a little geekier side, but they know healthcare and they know, um, they know, you know nursing and other of the disciplines. And I think that's the harder thing to teach people. Um, just having people that are um, analytical and want to really you know, solve the puzzle. Th those are the types of people that um, that seem to be um, doing well on our teams and and um, really find their place in our organization. We do have a lot of openings, so uh, like us on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> no plug here, Ellinga. No uh, from uh, also from a nursing perspective, we also encourage people who are trying to break in to be a super user to join some of the governance committees, and then we also ask nurses to sort of co-lead initiatives with the nursing informaticists on our team. And that's a great way for them to get a little bit more of an inside scoop on what it is like to be uh, in nursing informatics and give them a little more responsibility. And then when we do have positions open, we actually have a better idea of what the skills of these individuals are like. Well. Um. A few years ago at um, UC Irvine, um, we had the then CNIO or the, the then CNO and, and CIO partner together to um, build a program where they solicited in, um, interest from the, the nursing staff if they want if, to come over and actually work as analysts in IT. Um, and it, we had 40, I think, at least 40 applications, and we had 12 slots to fill. Um, and then we put them through a six-month training program. And um, many of those uh, analysts are still here at, at UCI. And, and this was um, a very rewarding program for <clears throat> the staff because they felt that they had an opportunity to do something different and something that they really had a passion about. Um, and it benefited IT as well, certainly. And it was a program that um, we highlighted in, in our magnet presentation because we are a magnet hospital. And um, they uh, thought very highly of that. So that's another, another way to do. Good. All right, so move, moving on. One thing we talked about was that the UC system, we've started to actually meet. Back in the day, most of the UCs functioned by themselves. We started to partner. The CMIO, CNOs, now we meet once a month. We share ideas. And there's been true synergy there, where we've taken ideas and really having a collective brain trust, move things along faster and more efficiently. So with that, with that, with, 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 with that being said, what are some examples of co co collaborative projects which have led to, e to a reduction in resource util utilization? Brian. So, uh, uh, Yes, the five UCs and all of us are meeting on a regular basis, and, uh, but we don't share the same technology instance. We all uh, are gonna be using the same electronic medical record vendor, but we all have our own versions of it. So this is where we've uh, had a lot of discussion and found opportunities, and each site may be doing a particular thing very well, and we're looking for opportunities to identify those and socialize them among the group, and then go back home and build those tools into our own system so we can realize those benefits. Uh, one of the ones that came up fairly early is that uh, at San Diego we had uh, uh, seen in the literature that uh, Stanford University had published back in 2013 some clinical decision support tools around uh, transfusion of blood. Uh, doctors are notorious for uh, practicing by habit. And many of us were trained back in residency that, oh, if you're going to give one unit of blood, you might as well give two. You know, why have to go back and write that order again? Well, it turns out that that can actually harm patients. You know, patients have transfusion reactions, there's a blood type mismatch risk, et cetera. Uh, and so the literature had evolved clinically to say, well, these are how your transfusion strategy should be laid out. And Stanford had built some tools in their EHR to support that. So we saw that and we said, cool, we think that's a good idea. We looked at our own internal data, we thought we had some opportunity. 
and uh, we built that into our own electronic medical record system locally, and then we had follow-up data. And I brought that back to the group, and it actually turns out that we're not the only group across the five UCs that are meeting and talking. Each site has a transfusion management committee, and they are sharing data at that level. And so I was able to get cross-UC comparative data for blood product utilization. I took it back to our group and said, it looks like we have some opportunities here uh, to do better <coughs> across the board. So we've put together that build and we've all made adjustments to our electronic medical record to implement that. And we're gonna be collecting data during 2017 to see the impact of that. That's just one example, but local needs and local experiences often drive the tools that you build. So it may be that uh, we had an issue with blood product uh, overuse, but another one, uh, another UC site might have an issue with lab overtesting. Uh, they've built tools in there to help mitigate that problem. Then we can bring that back to San Diego and put it in our own system. Uh, the collaborative has been extremely helpful to surface these local wins uh, and then for us to go back and look and find opportunities in our own home shops and move the ball down the field locally as well. Good. John? I was going to add a little historical perspective to that. I think when I was at UCLA, I remember we weren't even live yet on our, our EHR, but yet uh, UC San Francisco was going up, and then we just went up as a group to help provide support, even though we weren't expert users yet, having just gone to a couple of classes, I guess. And I think, you know, one of the things I remember from that was, one, the excitement about, uh, you know, this opportunity, but really learning how one campus or one health system handled their EHR and what we could do for ours, because, yes, we knew what our local needs would be. And over time, when they came back to from UCSF to help UCLA at the time with the um, go live, then they go, oh wow, that's kind of cool, we should probably do that for us. And I think that framework there, and plus, never mind the end users say, well, certainly like UCSF has already done this before, why don't we just ask them, why do I have to come up with a new order set or a documentation template? And so I think building those connections in a more formative way, in a pers and, and now as you hear the um, group meets on a regular basis, uh, so having that kind of mindfulness of saying, you know, as you know, you have to make the time for the things to work versus letting it happen organically. So I think it's really allowing the UC system as a group to reap the benefits. Ellen? So I think I speak for Sue and Margaret that we have really found great value in, um, in meeting on a regular basis and having dedicated time for collaboration. We don't always come up with the same <clears throat> solution, uh, but it does help all of our thinking, our thought process to get to the solution. So for instance, um, several of us were uh, searching for a secure text messaging solution and alarm management solution, and we spent a lot of time as a, as a, as a system uh, pondering this and thinking through requirements. And as I said, although we didn't all end up pursuing the same solution. I think each one of us benefited from the opportunity to have that collaboration time. Scott? And, and even what comes down to workflow development and um, just project management approaches, we've benefited from others. A, a current example is electronic prescribing control substances. You see San Diego has been very helpful and uh, we were thinking about all the ways it was going to take us to get our uh, doctor's identity proofed. And we just went to UCSD. How did you guys do it? And we pretty much stole their entire approach. Borrowed. Thank you. <laughs> I think just having someone to pick up the phone and call and, and bounce ideas off us it has been invaluable. Before um, this collaborative came together, I met Ellen once at an Epic user group meeting. I chased her down after a presentation and says, you know, we need to talk. And we said, yeah, we do. And, and it re we really never really got together until this uh, group formalized. Um, there's lots of things that we've been able to do in the system that we're um, able to share. One thing that we're working on at UC San Diego is um, patient acuity and, and capturing that just based on documentation out of Epic. We've been able to pull that together and we're going to be able to share that with the other UCs. We're all ma managed, um, uh, we have the same collective bargaining group um, across all the UCs with CNA, so we're able to um, you know, look at something um, standardized that we can roll across the other UCs, because it took a lot of time to pull that together and all the monitoring that we've done behind the scenes. So we just, you know, share it, pass it along, and um, you know, save a lot of time and money, which it's all related uh, across the UCs. Brian? 
So uh, I, I want to tell one more story along these lines to give some credit to our compatriot that's not here, and that's Dr. Russ Casina from uh, uh, UC San Francisco, who's the CMIO there. And uh, Russ and I ran into each other at uh, our electronic medical record uh, vendor meeting now two and a half years ago. And he said, hey, I want to let you know about something we're working on. This is before the collaborative had been put together. Uh, related to health information exchanges. You know, one of the biggest problems we face today is interoperability and the ability of systems to share records. He said, we're moving to uh, no longer require our patients to sign a consent to trade records between hospitals or between healthcare organizations. I said, that's fascinating, because uh, many people don't actually realize that under the HIPAA privacy rule, that is totally allowed. You can exchange records for treatment, payment, or operations. And so if you have a patient in your organization and they were seen across the street and you need to treat them and you need those records, you can actually reach out for those without necessarily getting a patient consent. But many organizations had, for historical reasons and, and uh, uh, other reasons, always asked for that consent. So uh, we had follow-up conversations. What arguments did you have with your compliance department? Did you have to get your legal folks involved? What are the configurations in the electronic medical record, et cetera? And I took this back home and put together a presentation to our folks, and I already had all the answers to all those questions. I said, well, San Francisco already had that fight, and here's how this came out and the arguments they used. And so it actually greased the wheels locally for getting this done in San Diego. And I can tell you when we finally made that conversion and we were able to trade records without asking a patient to sign a piece of paper and fax it somewhere, it was a game changer. All of a sudden we traded orders of magnitude more records than we ever had. Uh, I think we had a dozen patients opt out of having their records traded. But what we learned is that the patients out there are like, no, we expect you to be exchanging records in 2016. <laughs> this is something that you all should be doing anyway. And learning uh, from uh, those at San Francisco that had gone before made it just all that much easier to get that work done locally, and we are certainly uh, seeing the benefits of, of that in San Diego now. Good. All right, so I think what, what we've heard is there are many te technical be be benefits which we've seen, but the non-technical ones are even lar larger. So as a follow-up question, what are some non-technical -te benefits which have been realized by this group's efforts. John. Well, first of all, I think uh, she heard that, you know, we, we now not only uh, see each other at meetings, but uh, we actually meet on a regular basis and have teleconferences. And I think for me at least, while UC Riverside is a growing uh, system, uh, frankly, it is an N of one. I'm the only one <laughs> in my shop. And so it's kind of nice to talk or sort of watch uh, what the others are doing and, and think about as we move on our each our platform in a couple of months, you know, what, what I can anticipate. But it's really that sense of like, I have a, not only a um, group of uh, colleagues to call upon when I need things, but really it sort of helped solidify my career identity really as to what, um, what I'm about and what I do. And so I think that's really helped, uh, I would say personally for me, uh, in terms of a non-technical benefit that, you know, that is, I actually say yes, I'm a, uh, uh, CMIO and uh, for informatics is, is my career not versus just sort of dabbling in it. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right answer to the question, but um, the one thing that I thought about was, you know, when we first went into this as a group, we tried to identify what are the top issues that we're facing that we wanted to work on. And one of the things that we did identify was provider efficiency. And um, with the advent of an EMR, um, it got a little bit uh, more burdensome for physicians to document, um, to order. Uh, prior to that, they could um, pull out a piece of paper or actually a, another, an, another um, uh, personnel person could pull out a piece of paper and check things off and put it in front of the physician to sign. It was a lot, a lot simpler um, than doing this electronically. So we looked at that efficiency um, issue from the standpoint of are we optimizing top of license? How can we offload some of the higher level tasks to personnel that um, are at a lower level, the MA or the RN or the, or the LVN? So we concentrated on um, gee, how can we maybe better utilize protocols? 
Um, and then we focused in on health maintenance protocols. So we're in the process now of creating a library of, of, of protocols um, that all of us can share. Um, but this is, even though we would implement this technologically, um, this has a lot to do with operations, obviously. It's oper operations that has to buy into the notion of how to use protocols, what protocols they'll use, um, to find those policies, et cetera. So we're in the process of um, working with our organizations um, in doing just that. Good. Brian? So one of the other, uh, you know, admittedly less sexy ways that uh, we derive benefit here is in procurement and contracting. Uh, Ellen had mentioned secure messaging a little while ago, and when this uh, group was getting spun up, we all were kind of a little bit out of the barn and looking for a secure messaging solution to replace paging and that kind of thing. And we kind of lost an opportunity to all put our heads together as five institutions say, how should we collectively approach this? Uh, but it got us all thinking about, are we not more uh, powerful as a collective? If you put the five UCs together, we would be in the top uh, 10 uh, health systems in the United States in terms of size and, and patient volume. So one of the things that's come out of this is uh, when a new technology becomes available or even a new uh, non-technical things that requires uh, interaction with a vendor, one of the first questions we ask is, is someone else already pursuing this at another UC? If nobody is, how do we go in all together? And in fact, other collectives across the UCs are now in place for things like uh, procurement and contracting. And one of the operating principles we now have as a system is that any UC who uh, uh, contracts something with a vendor, all the contracts are being written to be extensible to the other UC health systems in the future. Because maybe all five sites aren't ready to go forward with whatever that is, but they may be so in the future. Uh, and that has positioned us well to meet some goals that are coming down the road. We uh, successfully completed a UC-wide uh, RFP for a vendor-neutral archive within the last year. We also successfully completed a UC-wide RFP for a vendor to provide the CMS-mandated radiology clinical decision support that everyone is going to have to have in their system as of January 2018. And so it gives us more opportunities to collectively put things in place and learn from each other and lessen wheel reinvention, uh, which was a big problem in, in years previous before we had this group. <laughs> Good. Anyone else? All right. One thing, too, that we've talked about has been car alarms. I'm going to pause, pause for a second there. We've all had car alarms. Car alarms go off. You don't listen to it now because car alarm goes off. It's called alert fatigue. Um, we've worked heavily, and I want the group to comment on this, is how we've tried to use our wisdom from the group to minimize that and to make the, make the alert count. So com comments on that. Eric, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I can speak to this. So, yeah, the phenomenon of alert fatigue is when any useless alert you see makes it so much harder to act upon to actually truly useful alerts. If the cockpit is all you know, blinking red and making all sorts of, you know, uh, sounds, how can you focus on the ones that really matter? Um, I'm going to steal a quote that Brian once said that part of this is that it is far easier for all, for all of us to build an alert than it is to ident identify a kind of a change champion. That doesn't make it more effective, but it's, uh, makes, it's, it's easier that's for us box. to do so, and yet that's probably not the right way to solve a lot of problems that we have. Um, alert fatigues, particularly medication um, alerts, is, is a really big problem in, in, a, in a lot of systems, and it's because that's one feature that really had no equivalence in the paper world, other than maybe pharmacists being able to select it out. There was no real-time um, point-of-care kind of feedback about this, and yet since uh, a lot, there are really two kind of medication vendors in the country that we all kind of import our medications and subsequently our alerts in, it's, um, they tend to be kind of conservative in that they want to make sure that you see enough and then it's our job to tone it down. So one kind of uh, example of this, uh, I'm a neurologist, but one of my physician informaticists is an obstetrician gynecologist, and she would say that, you know, every time I order oxytocin for one of my patients, I get an alert in the system that this could trigger pregnancy. Well, this 
medication alert is the indication to her giving the drug. How can I you know, suppress something like this that's completely useless? And you have to go through case by case on these examples to sort of stamp out, I guess you call them almost like weeds in a way, to make sure that it doesn't overcrowd everything else. There's a lot of metrics that have been developed over the last, I would say, when I finished residency in 2000, uh, the evidence-based medicine movements to develop metrics to evaluate the efficacy of interventions and studies. So this is like absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat. So now pretty well established kind of metrics to evaluate kind of healthcare in, in journals. And um, I think it's emerging that those kinds of metrics are going to be needed to evaluate some of these interventions within the informatics world so that we can be able to really compare what's effective and what isn't. Um, the electro I mean, that kind of literature I think is a little bit um, a little bit of time to catch up in the same way that kind of the evidence-based movements probably in the late 90s, early 2000s, has, took a lot of time to organize like what metrics are important to evaluate healthcare. Eric, I ask you a real fast follow-up question. Um, what is the percent override rate that, that we all see? So it's, it's pretty dismal in that, you know, if you get alerts, uh, override rates, um, less than 80%, that is considered remarkable. So That's what um, bad things are. Uh, you know, typical override rates for a lot of medication alerts um, uh, among our EHR vendor, uh, which really is really reflecting the medication vendors, it's typically on the order of 90%, so 9 out of 10 alerts are overridden, um, and that's probably average. I think anyone who's gotten below 80 is considered very good. And that's hard to, um, in any other sport or any other field, you know, that would be considered, you know, even a baseball player should be above, you know, <laughs> above 200, yeah. Scott? Um, so two points that are sort of anticipatory on this issue. One is the radiology decision support that Brian mentioned, that um, we're using this group as sort of the uh, going to be key oversight folks for all the alerts that are going to be mandated by CMS for our clinicians. And so I think we're all trying to uh, recruit folks within our health systems to make sure that we have the experts that are helping develop the criteria that drive these alerts and that the informatics user experience is as, uh, as, as least invasive into clinical workflows as possible. And then another thing I think there's a lot of potential that we haven't quite got around to yet, but because we're big enough, I think we have some sway over our vendors. And we want to start pursuing specific requests for changes with our vendors to help us be more effective with our informatics work. Good. Ellen? From a nursing perspective, I was going to add that the middleware vendors are uh, quite helpful in alarm and alert management to make sure that not everything becomes a page alert with one priority, but you could set different levels of priority to different people under certain conditions. So they've become quite smart, and I think that will really help uh, nurses getting them the right information at the point of wherever they are on, on their handheld solution with the right priority. Brian? So one of the things I've certainly uh, gained from being part of this uh, collaborative is to see how some of our sister institutions are using their governance structure and their intake process to evaluate requests for alerts. So the medication alerts come from third-party vendors. Uh, a lot of the alarm management uh, things are because of the monitors and we need to have those. But many times, and I've lost track of the number of meetings I've been in, where some uh, threat to patient safety happened or some near miss and somebody pipes up and said, well, can the electronic medical record have an alert that will prevent? And I just cut them off right there. <laughs> I said, yes, probably, but you're mistaking what an alert actually does. Uh, part of our role as clinical uh, informatics leadership is to educate on alert fatigue and to be strategic into what we uh, elect to build in the system as alerts. It's often the first thing people out there think of. It's the last thing we should try. Uh, I have also said that there's nothing like a well-crafted alert, but it's very hard to make a well-crafted alert. It's a lot easier to make a more blunt tool that has the opposite effect that's intended and increases alert fatigue. So some of our sister institutions have really good governance structures and intake processes and 
uh, they actually go back to a point, Sue, you were making earlier and say, yes, you've asked for an alert, but what problem are we solving? Let's unpack that because we have a suite of possible solutions we can bring to that that aren't necessarily something that pops up in front of somebody in front of a computer and interrupts what they're doing. Good. Anyone else? Eric? Uh, just echo. I, I, think, I think you're the one who said this. Some of our role as clinical informaticists is to do what the end user wants, not what they say, because what they say <laughs> <laughs> It may not be what they want because they don't appreciate kind of the full implications of, uh, of that. All right. So thing, thing and be beyond the EM, EMR now. Given financial pressures for affordable care, what risks do, do, you, do you foresee with continued training and, ed, and education of future pro, providers? Brian? Um. This is a risk. Um, everyone's time commitment is already spoken for or over -spoke, spoken for in terms of our physicians and nurses. But uh, you know, Scott made the point earlier that training on these systems is incredibly important. They are becoming more advanced, more complex. They are handling more uh, intricate workflows. And in many ways, a lot of us have been spoiled to some degree by our smartphones and other mobile devices because there's an intuitiveness there that we think exists. Uh, and I have to remind people, well, you think your iPhone is intuitive, but you've never tried to figure out how to do something on your iPhone during a busy clinic where you're already three patients behind. You know, you do it at an off moment when you have time to mess around with it, right? Um, we need to invest in the time to train our clinicians on these systems and not only when they join the institution or when we put a new piece of technology in place, but to do repetitive and refresher training on an ongoing basis. Uh, everyone brings a different skill level uh, to the electronic medical record and other technologies. You have to bring the people at the far end of the bell curve up to a standard, uh, but you need to move everybody forward as a group. And the only way to do that is to have time carved out from those of us who participate in training and all of our end users to make sure that is a priority for the institution. Because it's the only way that the technology will be leveraged to the degree it needs to be leveraged to make all of us successful. Good. Scott? Yeah, and we need the support of our CIOs and our CMOs to fund the trainers. That's a big struggle we're dealing with right now is just nobody, there's no bodies to actually go out and train the, train the, the providers. Um, I agree with, you know, allowing the time of the physicians because you're not earning money for the institution if you're being trained. But it's clear to me from working with many, many physicians over the years that just spending a few minutes with them, I can identify a few areas where their work habits are very inefficient and I can give them back an hour of their day very quickly. And that could translate into four more patients. And so it's just hard to get the calculus in such a way that it can get the bean counters to approve these sorts of efforts. Um, and recognize that no solution for training is gonna fit all either. I like to say everybody struggles and everybody struggles in their own way. And so it really takes a very personal touch. So it's not cheap training. We can't just have everybody watch an e-learning. We need to identify what, what's the problem this provider's having most and where we can save that person the most time and train on that. Sue? So? One of the things we've started is, with, is there's a common EMR out there that many of us are using, and we get nurses that come to us that have used it in other organizations. Um, we don't want to put them through remedial training that we, that we do or the basic training that we do for nurses when they come in. So we're having them... Um, uh, the ability to be able to test out on certain things. So we make sure that they get the things that are specific to our organization about our policies and using that tool. But we have some of these nurses that we're able to get them, them out of the classroom, you know, six or eight hours earlier because we leverage some of the training that they've had in other organizations. On the flip side, we've also started um, um, 
more advanced training later on that people can get back in, can use our education hours that they're funded for every year to come back, and we call it bolus to the brain for nurses, that they can come back and learn some of those things. They may have had that training when we started in 2011, and they had that four days that we spent training them of everything they needed to know in Epic, but how much of that did they really retain? 20, 25%. We can go, bring them back in and do this more advanced level training that they'll be able to um, take things, tools back um, to the bedside that they can use to make their day more efficient every day. Yeah, oh, yeah. Ellen, go. Yeah, I'm uh, quite passionate about this because I think we can't afford not to spend money on training. We have a new CEO at UCLA and she remarked to our team that when she walks the halls, the providers are fairly happy and she wasn't used to seeing that, happy with the technology. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens with a whole lot of hard work, and training's a big part of that. And Eric and I were just talking earlier this week about using data on, to identify providers who are struggling or have opportunity to improve how they're using the system to then guide how we use our training resources to target those areas. So I think you do have to be smart about, obviously, about how you use your training resources but it's so imperative to have a strong training team. Good, John? Yeah, I would add to that it's not just the providers coming into your system, but really we as informaticists really need to work with our medical schools to make sure we uh, train our medical students to utilize the EHR, not just not on a vendor neutral, just a vendor neutral way, but really more about, I think about the patient interaction because oftentimes the EHR becomes the patient, right? Because the provider's looking at it to enter information or to find information in order to make a decision on patient care. And maybe it's just because I'm a psychiatrist, but I really worry about losing the patient because, you know, you see that cartoon where the, you know, the patient's on the other side of the room saying, hey, I'm over here, pay attention to me. And, you know, are we educating our medical students to know which circumstance you can sit there and type, and there are times when you basically have to stop typing and make eye contact, as you heard earlier, to really affect that person um, that you're with as they uh, pour their heart out to you or something to that effect. <laughs> Bob? Um, let me just add that I think it's important that we advocate for at-the-elbow support. Um, we can do all the training we want to do, but until the, the, the providers are out there doing it and they've got how many patients um, stacked up that they're trying to see, they really do need the support uh, at first to, to be able to get through that learning curve. So, um, and I think in healthcare right now, funding is getting tighter and tighter, and that's oftentimes the first thing that is looked at, the first thing to go. So um, it is important. Very good. So there's been talk of trying to increase healthcare va value. Again, for a long time as fee for service in the great old days, we got, we got paid a lot, which those days were still here, they're not. And um, we have started to look at how can we really bend the cost curve? If we, if we want to still compete, we need to bend the cost curve. So how has our group tried to look at that? What can we do to help bend that cost curve? I stumped the group, no, yeah. Eric. I could start off but in a more general sense. You know, one of our top priorities, I think, when I, when I started is um, improving patient satisfaction. So how can we decrease the amount of time they have to document after dinner at home on uh, catching up on charting? But this movement toward demonstrating value sort of um, shifts a little bit of our kind of mindset toward what kind of activities that we should focus on because that activity of helping physicians, you know, with their efficiencies, so they spend time after dinner, that really doesn't have a, an ROI attached to it. It um, will certainly make physicians happier, but the move activities to actually demonstrate ROI or to be able to attach an ROI to things, let's say reducing blood transfusions or reducing unnecessary telemetry or reducing unnecessary tests, um, you know, part of maybe some choosing wisely initiatives, I don't think that was my priority a few years ago, but those types of things receive a lot more attention now. So it seems like to demonstrate our worth, it's uh, part of our job is to participate in activities that show that return on investment, that value, that probably wasn't uh, quite the case, I think, a few years ago. Right. So one of the challenges along these lines is that any one particular project we work on is incredibly unlikely 
to show either a financial return on investment or significant movement in a key quality indicator like hospital readmission rate or uh, medication errors, et cetera. But it's the aggregate of everything that we do. If I build a better discharge summary template and put it in the system, that doesn't mean our readmission rate is gonna go down by half. But if we pay attention to the discharge summary templates, the instructions, the medication prescribing workflows, the referral management of how to get the follow-up appointment, and if we build tools in the system to support all of those and create efficiencies all across the transition of care, then maybe we do meet, uh, uh, move the needle. One of the things, just to piggyback on what Eric was saying, is that we've certainly seen a shift in our organizational leadership in terms of where their goals and strategic priorities are. Uh, it's around access to clinics. It's around reduction in readmission rates. It's around bending the cost curve. And so it's incumbent upon us to find those levers that move the needle imperceptibly, but as we do several or dozens or hundreds of such levers, we really do help move the needle on financials. Scott? Yeah, and I think another sort of the, the macro version of that is analytics, right? So, um, the question is, why are we spending money on certain things? What are the changes that are providing value? Where are we spending money that we shouldn't be spending money? And now with the HRs, we have so much more data that we can start to answer these questions. And I think through this collaboration, we'll be able to share some of that knowledge that we learn in our own, uh, in our own neighborhood and share that across the city. Good. Eric? Yeah, the, um, I think a lot of us shared a, this goal of reducing readmissions. Um, you know, still the most expensive thing we do is hospitalizations, and the most, the strongest predictor of hospitalizations is a prior hospitalization. So this is kind of the target audience that is, you know, a certain percentage of our of our population. You know, accounts for a great, you know, um, a great, much greater proportion of the of their costs, and to be able to find ways to reduce costs among that group, whether through some care coordination or, uh, or identifying kind of high risk is kind of a, a, a big item. Um, we've faced this issue for probably a little bit longer than, than others because we have, we do some kind of costly procedures like transplants and we can't actually do them if the hospital's full all the time, so the, one of the uh, besides throughput, probably the best way is preventing people from being readmitted in the, uh, once after their discharge. Um, th uh, as Brian said, every individual tool probably doesn't have a, you know, an outcomes related to it, so we haven't been in the habit of doing so. But now, um, uh, the aggregate of tools, probably we should apply those same outcomes to the kind of set of tools that we do, even if we know that each individual tool you know, it won't be affected by itself. So I think that's a mindset that we have to um, start adopting because we have been used to, you know, well, surely, you know, this by itself isn't effective. Good, Scott? Yeah, and also taking it up into the population health level. I think now that we have the tools to be able to identify patients at higher risk, even if they're not in the clinic in front of me, we can now identify those and reach out to them and hopefully affect some change and save the healthcare system writ large money by preventing the first hospitalization by putting the person on aspirin so they don't have a heart attack in the first place. Wait, Brian? So just to, to circle back on earlier questions about, you know, how do we help innovate, uh, how do we align with strategy and, and putting it together with bending the cost curve, the other thing that I think we as a collaborative will be well positioned to do is to go forward as a group in implementing new and advanced technologies that are gonna help with uh, keeping people out of the most expensive place in the institution, which is the hospital. Things like telemedicine, video visits, care at home, all of these require a technical understructure and support from the electronic medical record. And we don't want to all have to figure out how to do those things individually. So I'm, I'm very excited that we now have our collective group that we're sharing information all the time. And I think as we move into that next phase of really advanced technology and pushing medical care outside of the hospital into the clinic and into the home setting, we are gonna be well positioned to do that more efficiently and more effectively across the UCs. Good. 